You know, they were on my case about coming up with a title for this talk, and I was kind of sweating bullets because I was trying to do some other things at the same time, and I just pushed this out the email door. So this is sort of what it is today, the title of my talk. Um, and it has a kind of preposterous subtitle. Can you all see these screens? I mean, they're a little bit marginal, but... Uh, this preposterous subtitle. So the title is The Sound of Bodies in Motion, and the subtitle is Exploring the Foundations of Music. And it's, um, I'll put it this way, I used to be a scientist, right? And now what I am is an artist who thinks about science and lets it inform the kinds of things that I do. And I also regard the, the creative work that I do as its own form of research. Um, I did uh, an interdisciplinary doctorate, as he said, at UC Berkeley. Um, this was after I decided to leave the physics department at UC Berkeley, which I entered. I entered the PhD program there in 1992. And uh, meanwhile, I was playing a lot of music, and I realized that at some point that that was actually what I wanted to do, and maybe I was even going to be allowed to do it in the world. And so in 94, 95, I was ready to leave academia, and then um, I met some professors who kind of uh, took me under their collective wing, and uh, we created this interdisciplinary PhD program for me. We called it Technology and the Arts, and I'm sorry to say it didn't contain much of either of those things. It was, uh, but basically I did a doctorate in this field called Music Perception and Cognition, which, um, is actually, it's been an existing research field for some time now. It's basically, it was an outgrowth of cognitive science, and it's studying essentially the cognitive science of music. Um, cognitive science itself is kind of a new field in the scheme of things in, academ in academia. It kind of uh, emerged out of the beginnings of computer science and philosophy and neuroscience and uh, psychology, and so it itself is an inherently interdisciplinary field, and people are thinking about the brain from a lot of different perspectives. Um, so this will kind of touch on some of the stuff that I did back then, which was in the 90s. I finished my doctorate in 98, and then I hightailed it for New York City and been living and working there as an artist ever since then. So uh, I'm going to start with some trick questions here. Um, the first is, what is music? <laughs> and what is it made of, and how do we perceive it, and how do we distinguish it from non-musical sound? Now, part of why I call this a trick question is because these are cultural distinctions. I mean, even the existence of something called music is itself some kind of cultural uh, proposition. Um, the distinction between music and non-music is definitely in the eye or the ear of the beholder. Um, it seems to depend who you, whom you ask, and usually your children have a different opinion than you about what music is, for example. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that later. But then, you know, what you can say is that it seems that every culture that exists on the planet has something like music. I mean, every culture. Not just music, but also dance. And they all, they coexist in every culture on Earth. This is documented by anthropologists. Every known culture has something that we could call music. So why is that the case? I mean, that seems to prove something fundamental about it. It's, it's universal uh, Existence seems to prove something. We just don't know what that is yet. <laughs> but then we might ask, well, what, what is it about music that makes it seemingly need to exist in human cultures? Does it do something special for us that nothing else does? Um, so I'm going to start with something that I believe to be wrong. And so that's why it says wrong on this slide, because I don't want you to write it down and think that I think it's right. It's not, if you ask me. 
Uh, so there's a very famous um, evolutionary biologist at Harvard named Steven Pinker. And you've probably heard of him because he gets, he's so famous that he gets asked about just about everything. Um, this is what happens when you become a super famous scientist is that you're called on to opine about just about anything that anyone could think of. So I was at this um, conference on music perception and cognition. It was an academic conference in the late 90s. And there was Steven Pinker. <laughs> he was our uh, keynote speaker, in fact. And it was clear, at least to me, that he hadn't actually thought a lot about this. But this is the sort of thing that we were at MIT, and I don't, I'm not going to, no comment. Anyway. <laughs> uh, um, but this was his kind of thesis that day that, um, and he's since repeated it and it appears in some of his books, that music is nothing but quote unquote auditory cheesecake. Now what does that mean? Well, if you think about what, what is cheesecake? All right. <laughs> uh, well, cheesecake is this concentrated dose of things that in large doses are bad for you, but in small doses you need your body needs them, your body craves them, and that's why you like the taste of it, is because uh, these are biologically necessary substances, sugar and fat, that earlier in human evolution were in short supply. And so we evolved to favor those things so that we, when we did find such things, we would stock up, like nourish ourselves with them. And now that it's available in abundance, of course, we gorge ourselves on it, but that's not helping us, right? Or is it? I don't know. Uh, did, was there a new headline today about cheesecake that um, no one told me about? <laughs> anyway, so this is the idea that uh, somehow music is the same kind of thing, that it's basically this concentrated dose of stuff that we need in small doses, but we don't really need it in large doses. So he views music as this artificially concentrated dose of stimuli that we have evolved to favor. So music is made of harmonic tones um, that we perceive as pitch, which is how the human voice works. It has a nice overtone series. Um, we have evolved to perceive melody in certain ways. And uh, it's, there's evidence that the mother's lullaby has some kind of uh, evolutionary significance. So the, calming and soothing and bonding kind of uh, practice. So there are some small details about music-like behavior that seems to suggest that in small doses it's useful to us. But then how do we get from that to Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd or something like that? You know, uh, that's kind of a large leap, right? So, so so then, like, let, so what is really wrong with this thing, with this idea that music is evolutionary or is auditory cheesecake? Well, if you ask me, and I actually asked him at the time, um, he doesn't uh, consider the evolution of groups or of human civilization in his view. His ideal listener is an, a listener in isolation, a solitary person hearing music as if on headphones, which is itself a possibility that only emerged in the last century, really, or less. And so it's hard to make a case that that's an evolutionarily significant scenario, right? I mean, what we have to remember is that music is something that was always made for humans by humans. It never was anything else. It wasn't something we discovered somewhere or that came to us from outer space or something. It's something we made out of stuff that we were able to do. And its mediation by digital technology or any other kind of technology is much more recent. So here's another view that I think is probably not wrong, and that's why it, that's what this slide says, probably not wrong. This is a, there's an author named Mark Changizi. He's also an evolutionary biologist. He's written a couple of books. Um, one is called The Vision Revolution, and the other is called Harnessed. Both of them talk about how these um, 
what you might call hallmarks of civilization are made out of things that we've evolved to recognize. So he argues, and, you know, contrary to Pinker, that music takes advantage of the existing skills we have, these specific skills of recognizing and decoding audible traces of human action. So instead of emphasizing things like pitch and harmony and the other kinds of things that you find people in music perception research doing, he focuses on the specific thing that we're able to do, which is to hear each other. We're used to hearing each other and knowing that it is each other, that it's ourselves, that it's somebody like us, another person in our midst. What he calls everyday human moving around sounds, the sound and rhythmic profile of footsteps as a marker of locomotive behavior. You know, uh, footsteps are interesting. Did you know that you can tell the gender of somebody by their footsteps just by listening? Um, so much so that actually orchestras have now developed this practice in auditions because they realized that they were so sexist. I mean, unbelievably sexist. Like if you see the Vienna Philharmonic, there's one woman in this group of 100 people. So it's, so they actually, uh, at least in the States, they've evolved this practice of um, having people, people audition behind a screen but also having a carpet between the wing, you know, the path from the wings of the stage to the, where the place where you stand to play is carpeted so they can't hear your footsteps. So they can't tell if it's a man or a woman behind this screen. So it's very interesting. This, uh, they've tried so hard to um, get rid of this tendency. But this is all because we know how to do this. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, um, basically what it is is that women's centers of gravity are lower. So the ratio of um, heel to toe rhythm, the timing of the heel to toe, uh, what do you call it, you know, the displacement between the heel and the toe is different for women than it is for men because of how we rock on our feet, because of our, your moment of inertia, because of your center of gravity. It's that simple, all right? Uh, so that's the sort of thing, it's a, just a simple physical fact about our bodies that we've evolved to recognize, all right? Um, another thing that we know how to hear is uh, very small Doppler shifts that have to do with direction of motion. Um, even in the case of people walking towards and away from you, we can actually perceive these things. Uh, people or animals, the, uh, the way that the pitch of, their, of the sounds they generate changes as they walk towards or away from you. And of course, the obvious correspondence between loudness and distance, so we can tell when something is far away based on that. So these are all just details about... Um, what we hear, that we know how to decode as information about the environment and about the people in it. So rather than suggest that humans evolved to hear music, Mark Changizi, the author here, argues that humans harnessed an existing perceptual apparatus, which had evolved for the perception of human motion, and used that ability, that or harnessed that ability and turned it into music because that's what so basically the claim is that music is made of that those kinds of sounds the sounds of bodies in motion um, sounds of human action